Uh, good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silent. Apologies have been received today from Jackson Carlaw and Lewis MacDonald and I would like to welcome Daniel Johnson to the committee who will be substituting for Lewis MacDonald. Um, as it's Daniel's first time at the committee, I'd like to invite him to declare any relevant interests. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, the only uh, relevant interest I think I have is that uh, I'm a member of the Labour Movement for Europe. Thank you very much, Daniel. Our first item of business today is a decision on taking agenda item three in private. Are members agreed? Our main item of business today is to take pre-budget scrutiny evidence from two different panels. Uh, we'll hear uh, first from the CORA Foundation and the Scottish Government's International Development uh, Division and later on from Historic Environment Scotland. Uh, I'd like to welcome our first panel of witnesses, Kirsty Norris, Project Manager International with the CORA Foundation, Claire Tint Irvin, Head of the International Division, Ian Nicholl, the Malawi Development Programme Manager, and John Mooney, the Rwanda Development Programme Manager with the Scottish Government. Uh, welcome, and thank you for coming to give evidence to us today. I'd like to open by inviting the CORA Foundation and the Scottish Government to make opening statements. <clears throat> Is this on? Yeah. <laughs> so good morning. Um, thank you very much for inviting us along this morning to talk to you about the work that we're doing with the Scottish Government. So uh, my role is to manage the international team at the CORA Foundation and we work closely with the inter international team at the Scottish Government to support the management and delivery of various funds across the programme. We have over 30 years of expert grant making experience and for the last four years we've been working with the Scottish Government to support the management of the Small Grants Fund and more recently we've been working um, to support the assessment of the main funding rounds as well as the Climate Justice um, Innovation Fund. So just looking at the Small Grants Fund then, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our impressions of the fund and some of the work that we've seen through the fund. And what's amazing is the, um, the way that the fund has really built capacity of the international sector in Scotland, um, particularly smaller organisations. Uh, what the fund enables um, these organisations to do is to access institutional funding, which is often a real barrier for organisations of that size. And the process of applying, managing these grants and reporting back um, to the Scottish Government is in itself significant capacity building for these organisations and really supports them to develop. And we really see the fund as building the sector for the future in Scotland. And this has been really evident in the most recent main funding round, when we've seen a number of small organisations who've come up through the fund um, go on to secure main grant funding. And it's really great to show the impact and the scalability of some of the work that's going on at this level. And then just looking, of course, to the most important part of the fund, which is the work that's actually going on um, in country. The um, nature of the organisations that are supported through this fund, they are much smaller and therefore the partnerships that they're developing in country are often grassroots and very community focused. And as a result, what you have then is um, very impactful and um, cost effective projects that are often reaching really vulnerable groups and hard to reach communities that can be difficult to access for larger organisations. So, um, yeah, that was what I wanted to say, really, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you about some of the processes that we have at the CORA Foundation to support the government and looking forward to answering any questions that you might have. So, thank, thank you. Thank you, Kirsty, and thanks to the committee for giving us this chance to, to give our evidence to you. Um, as you mentioned, my colleagues Ian and John are here. Ian covers the Malawi Fund, but he also has been very involved in the setup of the Small Grants Programme. And John, our Rwanda Programme Manager, has also been very involved in the setup of the Humanitarian Emergencies Fund. So if the committee have questions on those aspects of our operations, happy to take those as well. Um, I know the committee has already taken evidence on our new ID strategy, but I'd like just, just briefly to put uh, our session today in that context as well. Um, this is something that we see as, as really important to the work of the Scottish Government and somewhere we think that Scotland does have a distinctive contribution to make. 
And the areas that we, we feel that that is true is around the expertise that we can share. So we try to align our grants and our, our program management behind supporting that. Um, being innovative in what we do, we know that in comparison to many international funders, our budget lines and our capacity are limited, but we do try to be innovative and different and achieve impact through that. And our emphasis on partnership, uh, both with the organisations that we work with and with, with governments and others in our beneficiary countries and all our subject matter priorities for our funding are determined by uh, the appetite and interests of those partner governments. Um, we look for impact, obviously, in those beneficiary countries, but we also hope to have some impact here in Scotland. Uh, the International Development Fund is part of the Scottish Government's attempt to uh, develop Scotland as a good global citizen. And so, as Kirsty has outlined with the Small Grants Fund, we see some part of our purpose there is building capacity within Scotland to engage in international development and have that impact on the broader stage. And we're proud not only that some of the, the small grants uh, beneficiaries have not only gone on to secure more funding from us, but also from other donors, such as DFID or even the big international donors, so showing Scottish organisations then able to play that role on a global stage. Uh, we also see the programme as being an important part of Scotland's contribution to the SDGs, something that the First Minister has committed to. Uh, and again, partnership, a very important part of that. Just on the budget, it's a small budget. It has increased uh, consistently over the years, but it remains small by many other impact comparators. And we see that as being very important that we manage it appropriately to maximise its impact. We hope that our impact isn't necessarily entirely determined by the size of that budget and when international uh, comparators are looked at, some of the countries that come out top in those rankings, including the Nordic countries, often are not those with the largest amount of money to spend. But we think this is important that our grant management processes are rigorous as they should be. This is public money and we have to meet high standards of public accountability to it, proportional to the size of the organisations we're working with and to the size of the funding we're operating and effective and in terms of having appropriate controls in place. Uh, to do that, we comply, obviously, with the Scottish Government's internal audit proceedings. We have been reviewed and we have met the recommendations of, of those reports. Um, but we're also open to lesson learning, and I hope that during evidence session today, uh, we'll demonstrate to you that we are interested in continuously improving the way we manage this money. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, this is a big year for us. The first of the new strategy, that means we've been quite busy on the grant management front. Our Rwanda and Zambia projects have just started in October. Uh, that grant process ran over the summer, and I think was, uh, was running when the committee last looked at this area. Our small grants uh, bidding process has just finished. Well, Kirsty can tell you more about that. And our Malawi round is currently open. This has also been the first year of the Humanitarian Emergencies Fund, which has been activated three times, once for the East African famine, once for the South Asia flooding crisis, and once for the Rohingya crisis in Burma. I think that's, that's where I'd leave it. Um, just to say there were a couple of points in your papers around the process for the Rwanda and Zambia Fund where we have gone on to learn lessons from that, but we're interested in any more feedback you have. Um, and also around administration budgets, where I'd like to reassure you that apart from the Humanitarian Emergencies Fund, where a small percentage does administer the fund, all of our administration costs, including the costs for CORA's contract, are met from a separate budget line. They don't come from our headline development funding. Um, I leave it there and we're happy to take your questions. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you've talked about, uh, as you say, the, there's not a huge amount of money, but you, you have managed it with innovatively uh, in order to reach uh, vulnerable groups and do things differently. I wonder if you could give us some examples over how, how the funding has been spent in an innovative way. So I think that the, um, the Small Grants Programme is a great example of that. Um, First Aid Africa, which I think is one of the examples that, that Kirsty quoted, is a good example of that. It's a very different type of organisation. It was created by students um, within Harriet Watt University. Um, and that was initially entirely funded by, I mean, they would say themselves, by bake sales and that kind of level of fundraising. Um, and so to be able to work with an organisation like that to help them with their own financial compliance processes, but also then the impact that they're having on the ground using those student networks to really reach out on an individual level, individual places in Malawi and using first aid, which is an area that's often overlooked. So for us, that was a good example of an organisation doing quite unusual things, doing it from a very small starting point and then being able to make the case that their activity was really giving value, that we could build this organisation to an organisation could secure funding from others, um, and that can have real impact on the ground in Malawi. And their latest uh, 
uh, projects. They're looking at, at building institutions around first aid, how that then builds into hospital accident and emergency departments. They're looking at how that affects transport. So they're looking at developing a, uh, what they call an ethical Uber app which will engage motorcycle riders, motorcycle taxis to be drawn to the scene of an accident. Those people will then have basic training, they will have a line into the nearest accident and emergency department. So a group in society which is often seen as being responsible for some accidents, because um, a large number of motorcycles and taxis are involved in these instances, then being recruited and trained to be part of the solution. Um, and enabling those who are injured to get to help faster. So I think that's a good example of a very small scale, innovative, but with much wider applications. Okay. Um, when we took evidence earlier this year um, from um, aid organisations, there was a, a lot of positive feedback about the, the, small, the small grants uh, and the way it was administered. But there was some criticism about, um, about the, the larger funding programme uh, and how it was operating. And you'll be aware of, of those criticisms, particularly from uh, SCIAF. I wonder if you would be able to address those. So this is the first time we'd run the Rwanda Zambia round, and we ran it to tight timescales. We needed to do that to ensure there wasn't a gap in our funding. Um, what we did to take account of that feedback and to make sure that we learnt from that process was along with the Alliance, and I think Jane Summerson from the Alliance gave you uh, evidence last time also about this process. We ran a feedback day on the 7th of September to assess the overall feedback on the round once it had closed. Um, we are pleased that that was largely positive, but we have learnt from various aspects of it. One is that we are now having a longer time scale for the Malawi round um, to give organisations more time to prepare. Um, and the second was around turnover limits. We, we didn't want to accidentally exclude certain categories of organisation from our funding. Um, we have sought to learn from that and I think that's part of our continuous improvement when we're trying to do things differently. There is always feedback, but John, I don't know if you'd like to say more about that process over the summer and since. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I would just add that um, so following our, our consultation on our, our new strategy, which was published last December, um, one of the key things around that was about um, length of projects. So we've traditionally funded projects for one to three years, um, but the feedback we got through the, through the consultation was for, for longer projects to allow partnerships to be developed and built um, and to therefore affect the, the longer term sustainability of projects beyond the actual funding period. Um, so we took that into account and we, we've increased for the Rwanda Zambia uh, funding round uh, the project up to four and a half years years now to allow that sustainability to, um, to develop. Uh, and we also, again, based on, on feedback from the consultation, um, was we introduced a two-stage application process. So previously, we would just have a full application, um, and obviously, organisations um, would have to put a lot, of, a lot of effort and resource into developing those applications. Instead, we introduced a concept note stage, um, so a, a much kind of shorter um, application to complete, um, less resource intensive for organisations. Uh, then those that were successful at that stage would go through to the full application stage, where, of course, their chances of of being ultimately successful were, were much greater. Um, so we took that feedback into account and, and, and you know, that's what we introduced for, for, um, for the funding round uh, for, for Zambia and Rwanda. Thank you. Um, can I invite Ross Greer? Thanks, convener. Um, John's actually just touched on this in relation to the, the Rwanda and Zambia projects, but I was wondering if you could um, outline a bit more detail how you invite applications for funding. Are there specific organisations that you approach? Is it a very broad net that's cast? If you could just outline that process a little bit more, how you actually encourage organisations to make the applications. Briefly, and then ask Ian to speak for Malawi and small grants and John for Rwanda and Zambia. We cast net widely. It's an absolutely open call for applications. We publish on our website the criteria within which organisations will fit, but it's in our interest and the interest of our beneficiaries to get the widest range of applications possible and that's, that's what we would seek to get. I'd just also highlight the role of the networking organisations within Scotland, the Alliance, the Scotland Mali part, which Charship protect particularly in terms of publicising then to their members as well. Um, so we would also seek to use those networks, but, but Ian and then John, is there anything? Yeah, yeah so um, as Claire said, we, we just go on a, a full open call for funding. We also hold an information day, so we are having an information day for the Malawi um, funding round on the 29th of November, and we'd ask all um, interested parties to come and you know, find more, more about our, um, our funding rounds. Um, I think the other way it's done is through 
um, for Malawi, certainly, we have a, co a cooperation agreement. And in that, we um, commit ourselves to fund to the government of Malawi's um, priorities. So that's in health, education, civic governance, um, economic development and renewables. So we, we would look to um, organisations who work in those five areas to um, put applications in, and we would certainly encourage them to do that. Yeah, just really to add to, to say, yeah, as, as Ian and Claire have said, it's really just a very wide net. We're, we're very welcome um, and have funded uh, private sector organisations, uh, universities, health boards, um, local authorities, as well as the more traditional international development NGOs. Um, so it's a very wide, uh, wide net, and there are a few um, criteria we have around about an organisation being a, a legal person um, and having a presence in Scotland as well. Um, but other than those kind of very few essential criteria, uh, eligibility criteria, we have a yeah, very wide net, and we, we welcome uh, and encourage um, applications from, from across uh, sectors in Scotland. Thanks. And once applications are in, if uh, you'd be able to outline the process for deciding whether or not an application, uh, whether the funds are granted. Looking particularly at the, the main uh, funds, I think uh, other members are going to ask more about the, the small grants fund, but with uh, main grants and the, the other streams, if you could just outline a bit more detail what the process um, is there. My understanding is it's a relatively transparent process, but if you could outline that, that would be helpful. Certainly intended to be. I might ask Kirsty, she's sitting here <laughs> patiently beside me and she's involved in the assessment process, if she could outline the process for us. Of course, yeah. So we have um, a, a rigorous process that goes through a number of different stages. So once the fund deadline closes, um, applicants, they are invited to email us through an, an application inbox um, and they're given an automatic response so they know that their, um, their application has been received. And the first part of the process is a, a very basic criteria check. So as John talked about, there are a number of um, essential criteria that applicants have to meet to um, enable them to be eligible to make the full application. Um, what we do is we very quickly go through that um, criteria check and what that allows us to do is inform um, applicants very quickly if they're out with criteria. So rather than asking them to wait two, three, four weeks to have a response. If they're not within the criteria, um, then they will be told within five working days. Now, for the rest of the applications that come through, um, the first stage of that is the concept note process, and that's a much shorter application. And the point of that really is to allow organisations to give an overview of the project that they're proposing, to tell us about the partnerships that they're proposing, how they intend to work, the essentials of the needs assessments that they've carried out, and uh, an indication of their budget. And what that means is we can do an assessment based on um, the information they've given us rather than asking all applicants to go through what's a fairly lengthy full application process. So it allows us to do almost like a first sift um, and it, it supports a better um, success rate in the fund rather than asking people to go through. Um, so once we've done the criteria check, we then do due diligence checks. So we look at applicants' um, accounts, we look at organisations' governance. So for example, we look at things like the makeup of their board. Uh, we look at whether they have any engagement with diaspora groups in Scotland, for example, which is really important for a fund of this nature. Um, and we also look at previous years' um, expenditure and income and look at things like what types of funds they have and how they're managing funds, because that also gives us an indication of whether they're able to manage a, a funding um, amount of this size, particularly for the, the larger funds. So once we've got that part of the process out of the way, then we go on to do an assessment of the concept note. So we look at those key areas that, um, that have been outlined in the concept note, and um, we have a, a scoring pro forma, and it's a shorter one for the concept note. Um, and what that does is that allows us to look at key areas um, of the process and look at key areas of their application and attribute a score to those different areas. Um, once we've done that, so we have grant assessors who work on that process, we then move on to what we call our challenge process, where we meet as a team, so there's a minimum of four of us, and we look through all of the assessments that we've carried out, and we essentially ask the assessors to justify the scores that they've given. And from there, we are able to come up with final scores, and each um, each application is giving, uh, given a RAG rating, so red, amber, green. Red, we wouldn't recommend that the applications are continued on to the next stage of the process. Amber is a project that we feel has real potential, but there are some areas possibly of concern that we would want to go back and clarify. 
and then green is a project that we would um, feel comfortable in recommending for funding. And we then take those rec recommendations forward to um, the team at the Scottish Government and they're able to then select the applications that they'd like to take forward. So that is the concept note stage. And then for the main grants, we do exactly the same for the full application. So any organisations that have been successful in that first stage would then be invited to send us a full application. And that has additional documents that they have to complete. So they have to fill a full application form in. They also have to complete a logical framework, which is a monitoring and evaluation tool that we use to allow them to demonstrate how they're going to um, measure their progress against their set outcomes. And we also ask them to complete a comprehensive budget document, which allows us to look at all of the various lines of expenditure and how they plan to spend over the five year period. And the process that I've just described to you, we go through exactly the same process for the full application. So we've obviously done the due diligence checks. That's already been um, done as part of the first stage. But we go through a detailed pro forma, which scores against the, the various different areas that we're looking at, um, particularly focused on partnerships, project management, project design, the reasonableness of the budget, whether all the documents make sense. And whether what they're proposing seems achievable and realistic. Um, and then we have another challenge meeting and the full stage application includes um, senior members. So we have our head of grants that's involved in that process and our deputy chief executive that come into those um, challenge meetings. And then we write a report to the Scottish government with our recommendations, again, using the same RAG rating system. So it's a fairly lengthy process, which, um, but we are, we're very confident that it's very rigorous and sort of stands up to both internal and external scrutiny, all the steps that we go through. That's useful. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, just to, to follow on from that, um, it's obviously a relatively small uh, budget that we've got, so it's important to ensure that projects that are funded are genuinely developmental compared to, say, the history of, of Western aid projects that have often been more about managing a situation than developing it. How do you assess whether uh, once project has been granted and it's uh, been through process, what is your monitoring? Uh, what are your monitoring criteria for ensuring that project has genuinely developed a community or developed a nation? Okay, well, I mean, I think the the essential need for um, that approach that you're talking about is is key, and actually, it starts right right as part of the assessment process, and it's one of the areas that. Um, form a sort of key part of the assessment is looking at the organisation, the partnerships that they've developed. So they, there must always be an in-country partner. And as part of that, we ask them to give um, robust evidence on what types of needs assessments they've carried out in country. And taking that a step further, we ask them to evidence how they've consulted with the communities in which they're going to be working, but in particular, how they align with the national government strategies, demonstrating that the project that they're proposing is actually something which has been outlined. So, for example, the government of Malawi, if they have particular priorities around health, we would look to see that that project fits. And it's more than a tick box. They have to really evidence that as part of the application. And another thing that's really key um, in our assessment is looking at the sustainability and exit around these projects. Um, they are five-year projects, which um, sounds like a long time, but in development terms, uh, that can, you know, the, how much can be achieved. It takes a long time. You have to get to know the community and, um, and really set that project up to ensure it's going to be effective. So one of the things that we look for is evidence through the application that they've thought about the longer-term impact of the project. They've thought about things like capacity building, particularly of national staff, um, and how that project will be continued and carried on in the future beyond the life cycle of the funding. And that then forms a key part of the monitoring process, um, which for the small grants and for the larger grants, um, as part of the uh, reports that they're completing, they have to evidence how they're working towards that exit strategy or how they're working towards that vision of sustainability for the project. And using the logical framework that we talked about, they also have to give um, numerical and also qualitative um, evidence around how they're working towards the objectives that they set, which also tie into the longer term sustainability of the projects. And just one final question, Fiona? Oh, sorry. Just, coming sorry. On that. Uh, just on the monitoring, actually, the, the monitoring evaluation 
um, of the projects is carried out by the Scottish Government staff. So there's a, we have three teams, Malawi teams, um, Rwanda and Zambia, and we carry out six monthly monitoring of the, the um, projects. Um, and we look at five areas, um, and these are five areas that they're actually the original assessments are done on. So we, we look at the relevance, we, every six months we get a report in from the, um, gr the grant holders, and we look to, to see it still relevant. We look to see, look at the beneficiaries. Are the beneficiaries still receiving those um, um, promises that were, they were um, given? Are they covering the issues that are originally covered in the application? So if they're going to deal with matters like HIV or education, is that still the case? Are the project still doing that? Um, we look at the effectiveness and um, the progress to date. So every six months they report to us about progress. So we're checking that progress is in line with what um, is expected of it. We're looking to see if the projects change direction because you know we've obviously agreed to do X, Y, and Z. And if they're doing A, B, and C, then we want to know why that is. Um, and you know, might be that we might, might be a valid reason for that, but we'd like to, 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 to know that. Um, we look at the efficiency, so we're looking at the spend, you know, is the spend in line with what they, um, they had envisaged at the beginning, or has there been change, changes in spend, has it been spent on, you know, money being spent on one area rather than another, and why, why, why is that? We, we especially look at sustainability, and this, this is the issue you'd said, you know, in the past people have just gone and, and thrown money at, at a problem, um, and then walked away from it. We, we don't want that to happen. We, we are looking from the very beginning that project is sustainable. So once our, in Malawi, it used to be three years, it'll now be four and a half years. At the end of that four and a half years, is there something going on with that? You know, is the community going to take it on? Um, is there going to be a lasting impact? Because we don't want to, to waste taxpayers' money and actually don't want to raise expectations in Malawi, in my case, um, that, that are um, 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 not fulfillable and then we're looking at the impact you know what is the overall impact not only in the area concerned but is there a, a higher impact you know um, um, maybe some institutional learning or is there been a change has there been a change of policy um, through one of our, our projects so we monitor that on a six monthly basis thank you just one final question um, are there situations in which an organization might receive funding without having gone through the grant application process Yes, yes. Um, we have in the past um, match fund, and cer certainly for Malawi, this has been part of the, the, it was part of the old policy purely for Malawi, and then in the new strategy, we have a match funding um, um, policy. And that had been used to, to quite good effect. So um, recently, we have match funded a project with the College of Medicine in, in Malawi, and that is the Blantyre Blantyre project. We provide further information if you wish. But um, we, we have committed to £1 million over the next five years, and that's been matched by the um, funding from the World Bank and also the Liverpool Wellcome Trust. Um, and so we're working with um, the College of Medicine, Glasgow University, the College of, um, and the um, Liverpool Wellcome um, Trust. And the primary object of the project is to look at um, non-communicable diseases which are prevalent in actually the west of Scotland. And it turns out that they're actually becoming prevalent in the middle classes in Malawi. And so it's an interesting project to actually look at two different communities and see actually they're the, the suffering from the same range of illnesses. Is there a connection? You know, is there something there? But actually a byproduct of that will be that we will um, build, uh, we will we'll help um, refurbish some research labs within the college. And that will have a two, 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 twofold um, um, in benefit. One, it will allow um, better um, laboratory facilities for the college itself to call upon. But actually, they're also looking to use that um, to maybe carry out research and maybe drug research. And so that way, the college will hopefully bring in money from pharmaceutical companies who will see they've got world-class um, world facilities. And that will help build the capacity of the, the, the um, project, as, uh, of the college as well. So I think that quite a good um, example of where we have gone out with the application process, but actually attracted money in. What, what the, sorry, before others come in, I'm just getting out, know, what are the transparency measures around that? So that it seems pretty clear what the transparency measures are around the grant application process. But if there are projects out with that, and it sounds like well-justified projects, what are the transparency arrangements? Well, we, well, I would just say that the competitive challenge model we have is for the development assistance element, okay. and all of the development assistance, so that 75% is done through the competitive challenge process, which is, is what Kirsty described. We also have the capacity building 
Strand, which is where the project that Ian's mentioned um, comes through. And that is where we're looking at organisations in Scotland that have particular expertise or capacity to work with partners and beneficiary countries and very transparently on the priorities as set out to us by the governments in those transparency countries. Another example of a project under that would be the work that Police Scotland have done in, in Malawi around gender-based violence. So Police Scotland did not go through a challenge process to do that. They were the organisation with the expertise in that area in Scotland. Um, so that element of the, of the fund is done like that. The other element is the, the humanitarian, particularly in the past and the previous situation, where, for example, we had the, the hunger crises in Malawi, where we were able to use some money just to, to put through international NGOs that were active on the ground or match funding for comic relief. So the, the competitive challenge model that we described is what we use for the development assistance, which is the vast bulk of our funding. But these other streams of capacity building and humanitarian assistance operate differently. But they are transparent. All the documentation is available. So, so they are there available for scrutiny. There isn't just necessarily that competitive challenge access process to it. And, and, and they, all, they all report in the same six monthly cycle as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Camina. I'd just like to really follow up on um, what Ross was uh, asking at the beginning um, about the competitive challenge uh, mechanism there. And you, you've outlined the, the various stages, but in particular at the assessment stage, according to your submission here, you've, you've six different criteria which you then score and then give a, a RAG rating role. Could you, could you just explain how those scores are attributed in each of those uh, areas? I mean, are, are there uh, criteria that you set in advance? How do you measure against those? Uh, I'd just be interested to hear a bit more about how those scores are set. Yeah, of course. So we have, um, as I, I talked about earlier, we have a scoring pro forma, and that outlines those key areas that you saw um, in, the, in the evidence that I provided earlier. Now, what we have is within each area, then, we have the different elements of the application form that, and the different key areas that we would want to see and as part of that then we have a scoring table so we have um we have a, a process of grading so we look at the level of evidence that's given um for each of those sections so we would look at um for example we would talk about very good evidence so evidence that gives us no doubt that this applicant has considered the needs of the community, for example, if we were going to look at needs assessment. So we would, um, we would look, at, look for evidence that they have um, co um, collaborated as part of that needs assessment process. We would look at evidence that they have considered the wider context in country and looked at, as I said, national strategy. And that would give them a top score of 10. And then down, it kind of goes from there. So you have excellent evidence, good evidence, clear evidence, and then we would have unsatisfactory and no evidence given at all. So we do have cases where in applications, people just don't answer the question or it's very clear that they haven't given it full consideration. And what we then do is we take those scores and we use that as a benchmark. And what that means is that every, um, every application that we look at, we're, we're looking at the answers they've given, the information they've given, and we're marking it against you know, the same benchmarks for, for each area. And just as part of that, we also apply weightings to different areas. So in discussion with the Scottish Government, we look for areas um, that are particularly important as part of that assessment. So monitoring and evaluation is incredibly important. We need to make sure that the project is going to be monitored effectively so that you can see that the outcomes that were set are actually going to be achieved and adhered to throughout the project. Needs analysis, I've already spoken about that quite a bit, but it's a very, very important part of the process budget, making sure that you're getting value for money and that the budget's realistic and hasn't, um, has been well thought out, those areas will have weightings applied. So a higher score would be given for excellent evidence, for example. Um, so they might receive a score of 10, whereas another area might, the excellent evidence might receive a score of 8. So we use that. And then as part of the challenge process, that's the opportunity for um, to make sure that there can be no bias in the process whatsoever. So um, everyone in that challenge process has read the assessments, they've read the application, they've read the assessments, and it's the opportunity for the grant assessors who have attributed those scores to justify why they felt that score was appropriate. And at that point, if it's felt that a score has been given unfairly, so a low score or a particularly high score, there would be some discussion around that and an agreement would be reached on what the most um, appropriate score would be um, and then at the end of that we have um, we have a sort of 
we look at the scores that we've got and that's when we come up with the RAG ratings. So we can see then um, from the scores we have where the splits are and that's when we decide at the end of that process what would be considered green, what would be considered amber and what would be considered red. So, so just briefly, the, the weighting is particular, particular uh, categories of the six categories have relative weightings to one another. It's not weightings within, fine, thank yeah. you. So just on that point, I mean, you, you, you set out there how it's based on evidence. That's evidence provided by the, the, the applicant them, themselves. So in a process like that, you're obviously very dependent on, on what they give you and what they're, they're saying, which is not necessarily the same thing as their, their actual capability and actually a capacity to deliver. So what, what do you do to actually look at what is delivered as compared to what was originally put in, in the application. And, and, and uh, further to that, what, what's your process for actually ass assessing your, your, your ingoing criteria and, and uh, altering them at, you know, uh, uh, on the basis of, of what you find? I think for, for the criteria, probably it would be more appropriate for the... Yeah, yeah. I mean, so... We need to, there's no point uh, giving a grant to an organisation that is not capable of delivering and then only finding that out at the end of the process when they didn't deliver. So that, that's an outcome that we seek to avoid. I mean, through the assessment application process, there are parts of the form which are designed to assess the capacity of the organisation. So, you know, what financial compliance do they have in place? What audit do they have in place? What's their track record? And so we do seek to, to get that information from the charity uh, or from the organisation that's applying for the grant funding. We do then, as I said at the beginning, we're seeking to build that capacity. So we will support people as well. And that's part of what the ongoing monitoring process is. So if, if something is not on track, the idea of the regular reporting is that we are able to intervene and say, you know, what, what is going wrong here? And I'm sure Ian and, and John can sort of talk in more detail to that process. Does that get to what you're asking about? Point. My point is actually how you assess the effectiveness of your assessment criteria itself rather than actually how projects are being delivered while they're okay. in flight. It's that, it's that kind of ability to reflect and, and scrutinise your own processes. So when we, you were talking, when we look at the overall outcome of an assessment process, how confident are we that the right projects and the right how organisations are... How reflective are your criteria? Yeah. I think that is built into the process, it's built into the challenge structure. Yeah, I mean, the challenge structure um, is, is a really good way of, first of all, making sure that the, the process is, is very transparent, that different people are, are going through and looking at the scores that have been attributed. But in terms of reviewing the actual scoring pro formas, um, that's something that we do at the beginning of every round. So we make sure that those pro formas reflect the different priorities that have been outlined as part of the fund background and criteria. So, um, we make sure that we um, pass them to the team and we review them together and we can also tell through our own assessment so um, if there are areas where we are assessing but we're consistently not having enough information coming through the application that would give the indication that possibly the application form and the assessment are not talking to one another so that's something that we would review and as part of our process, we do a lessons learned report at the end. So we look back at the funding process and part of that um, is reviewing the actual assessment process itself. So we look across areas in that report um, around the relevance to the criteria, what we found was coming through and how it was relevant to the criteria that had been outlined. And we look at some of the challenges through the assessment process in particular areas where we were struggling to get enough information. And what we do then is look back and ahead of the next funding round as we have done for Malawi we then look to revise the pro formas and as well as revising the application forms for the applicants themselves to make sure that those are as conducive as possible to make sure that the assessment process is fair um, another point that I think is important to add is that as part of the assessment process we don't simply assess on the basis of what we've been given. So we build into that process telephone assessments. Um, we're very aware, and again, talking about building capacity, that if an organisation has never applied for institutional funding before, they might actually find it a challenge in itself applying you know, the application process, going through 
um, putting together an application, putting together a budget. So once we've done a first review of the application form, we'll set up a telephone appointment with the applicant and we'll have a, usually about an hour to an hour and a half phone call and we'll go through the application with them and any areas where we were not clear or would like more information, we give them the opportunity to actually talk to us about their project because often that's a really good way for us to really get a full sense of their capacity, their knowledge of the project. Um, I think you mentioned before that somebody could write something in an application, but does that really give an indication of, um, of how well you know they, know they know how to deliver it? And often through a telephone assessment, you get a much better sense of someone's in-depth knowledge and understanding of what they're going to deliver and the community they're going to deliver it in. What you'd have with them is by telephone, you wouldn't be meeting face-to-face. -face. Um, we don't have face-to-face -face, um, conversations largely due to capacity and time, um, but actually as part of the Malawi funding round that's coming up, we have, we're have we building that into the process, particularly because of the size of funding that we're talking about. Um, telephone assessments is something that we use across all of our different funding streams at the Cora Foundation, and we find them to be very effective. And we do also have the option of Skype as well, which we're doing more and more. Um, but yeah, particularly for the Malawi round, we're hopeful that we can do face-to-face -face assessments, because again, you get a lot more information um, at that type of level of communication with applicants. And as Ian mentioned, there'll be the information days, but also we're looking to repeat those through the assessment process. So those organisations who are successful in getting, for example, through from the concept note to the full application, and we will again offer them the chance to come in and meet us and have a whole day of discussion. So, I mean, that's a chance to do a face-to-face -face assessment and also for them to surface any issues they're concerned about or us to have the chance to talk to them in more depth about any points that have come up in the assessment process. Does that get closer to what you were... Yeah. Other members wish to come in? Is it? Can we move on? <laughs> uh, Rachel Hamilton. We talked a lot about um, the application process um, and the criteria of the funding. I just wondered what kind of consultation the Cora Foundation have with the Scottish Government um, and a, what sort of pitch uh, you go to the government with. I mean, it must be very difficult to turn down uh, projects or have projects in the in the wings on in the amber uh, set, uh, criteria. I just wondered, you know, what what interaction, um, what discussion you have with the Scottish government prior to um, the allocation of funding. Of course, yeah. So we have um, we have regular um, communication with the Scottish government at different sort of key points in the in the funding process. So. Um, we um, have sort of we we get together and talk about the criteria ahead of the fund because what's important for us um, to make sure that we can do the best assessments possible is we need to know the criteria inside out and and understand exactly what the priorities are for the funding round and how we can best um, assess those applications and you're right it can be very difficult particularly when you have amber projects that you know um, have a lot of potential but you're unable to take them forward I mean the reality is that um, they'll only ever be a, a small number that you know when you have a large number of applicants um, coming in the assessment process itself I would say we we do consciously that we we almost kind of disappear off that has to be a very independent process and um, so during once the fund has closed we um, we go and we do our full process that I've described before and the communication during that process that we have with the Scottish Government is mainly around areas where um, something might come up in an application and we're not 100% sure how that might fit with um, with criteria so for example um, if something comes up in a budget if somebody's asked for something a cost which we're not sure exactly whether that would be acceptable or not that's the type of um, thing that we would then get in touch but really at the end of that process we write our recommendation report so what we do is we um, we give full justification for the, the scoring um, and we give justification around the RAG rating. So, for example, if it is an amber, we would outline the concerns that we might have, why that project hasn't quite made it into the, the green, the top of the pile. And for any in particular um, who have been given a red rating, we make sure that that's, that's fully justified you know, through the, the discussions and the process that we've had. And then following that, we um, we have a meeting between ourselves and the international team, and we go through every single project. So we don't just talk about the greens or the ambers or the reds. We start from the beginning and we talk through the process. We talk through um, our findings in the assessment, our concerns, what we found was really positive about the projects, and again, um, giving the kind of reasons for why we've um, given a recommendation of funding or, or not funding. And from there, really, I think probably pass over to you as to how you take our recommendations forward. I think it also depends on the situation. 
the, the conversation depends on the situation. So I'm, I don't think it was an issue with Rwanda and Zambia, um, because I think they had enough projects to cover, to, to, to meet the budget we had. Um, it was a difficulty we had in Malawi, in the last Malawi round, where we had, um, we received 52 52 applications, and at the first, so they, um, it was a previous assessor actually, and they um, gave a RAG rating. And originally, we only had seven applicants who passed green, so that meant we then had and that only took up a, you know, a, a small amount of our, our um, available budget. So we then had to make a decision about whether, you know, do, do we just end there, or do we look for a, a process where we can, you know, use our budget as, as, as you know. Um, effectively. Um, so in that conversation was um, with our assessors, they came in with the AMBER projects and we had a dis discussion about um, what they thought was wrong with it, how, how that um, particular project could be brought up to, to, to um, um, in speed. So we, we selected, if I remember correctly, was it, I think it was maybe 20 projects and we went back out to those projects. These were projects we thought, well, you know, they were just just missing the benchmark and you know they could be brought up so we worked with them over over a, a, i think a two-month period or a three-month period to bring the projects up to 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 fundable standards and um, it still meant there was one or two projects that when we there were still sort of little issues but we we um, built that into the the grant conditions so one of the conditions would be to you know do x or do why within the first six months. So it's a different conversation depending on um, you know, the, the, the funding situation and also the, the situation with the, the applications themselves. Can I ask um, Mr Nicholl as well, you mentioned uh, your engagement with DFID and you also uh, mentioned uh, uh, private sector funding as well. Um, do, do, does the private sector come to you um, or do you go to them? I mean, what kind of relationship do you have with them and how much engagement do you have with DFID? Um, the, on the, on the pri private sector, they, they, they apply to our, our um, funding um, um, rounds as, as any other applicants would. Um, so they, they are part of the competitive um, 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 competition. Competi anyway, um, <laughs> Challenge process. Challenge process, that's it, yes. Um, for DFID, we keep in touch with DFID. Um, yeah, maybe I mean... So for DFID, I mean, the, the scale of what they're doing is so different from us. So, so there's a limited kind of natural intersection, but, but where we do work with them very closely and have a good relationship is very much through their country offices in our beneficiary countries. They have that presence on the ground and that local knowledge. So we would always, for example, when we visit country, we would always speak to them about both their assessment of the local conditions, the context, um, you know, any particular information we ought to be aware about areas where our partners are operating, anything that's, that's of concern to them. So we have a very kind of close natural relationship with them in country. When it comes to, to the UK based side of things, we have a kind of ongoing dialogue, but the, the sort of level of intervention which DFID is doing, the level of intervention which we're doing, it, it tends to be quite different. And one exception to that is DFID have actually introduced a small grants programme themselves quite recently, which is, well, we don't have absolute evidence that it's modelled on ours. It, it's quite similar to ours, um, which we take as a vote of confidence. Um, you'd have to ask them more about the background to that. But I mean, that, that shows that I think that they think that some of the stuff we're doing is innovative, as I said in the first place, and, and kind of worth modelling their activity on. So we do keep in touch on that basis. Okay, thank you. Spari Gujan. Hi, thank you. It's just uh, going back, back to Ian, Ian Nicholl, some of the points that you made earlier in response to Ross Greer's questions. And it was about the monitoring of projects and uh, the importance of the longer term sustainability. And I was wondering, so is the monitoring process for, the, for those larger projects similar to the monitoring process for the smaller grants as well? And it was just really to hear a bit more about that. The monitoring um, process for the small grants is similar. Um, applicants, once they've been successful, organisations are asked to um, provide reports on a six-monthly basis. So the reports are looking at key areas um, that, to check that things are on track. So we look at um, asking them for an update on activities, any delays, any issues that have arisen during the reporting period. Um, we ask them, as part of their original application in the small grants programme, to outline an m and &E plan. So whilst they don't have to complete a logical framework, which would probably not be seen as proportionate for the size of funds that they're receiving, they do have to outline what different areas they'll be measuring um, to help 
track and um, progress against their outcomes so they're asked for an update and um, and then importantly they're asked to do a, an expenditure so they they give us a, a kind of detailed um, plan of how they've spent their budget next to what they planned and what they're planning to spend in the next um, in the next period and one of the things that I think is really important to note is that we really encourage sort of the development of professional relationships with these organisations um, over the three-year period and what that allows us to do is to have a really sort of transparent approach with them so over the time that we've been managing the funds we we do see organisations they feel able to tell us when things are not on track and what that allows is sort of early intervention if something isn't going as planned you know with any project you might have a great plan at the beginning and then you get there and something goes wrong there could be an election or something changes in country and that can have an impact on the project so it's really encouraging for us to see real honesty coming through in the reports and that's really really important um, because it does allow us to work with them and with the, the team um, at the government to make sure that we can support those organisations. Um, one of the things that's great about this fund is we want these projects to succeed, we want them to be a success. You know, it is a competitive process, but it's one that is about building capacity and seeing success for the organisations and the projects. So there's a real feeling that if they can um, tell us what's happening, we can support them in every way possible to make a success. And, the on, and then the only um, report, the 12-month the report, is a bit more reflective. So it's looking back at the year, lessons learned, how they're disseminating any learning that they're gathering through the work that they're doing, and their annual payment of their fund. So they, the small grants, they have annual, um, the payments they have it once a year, and those payments are made on the basis that both of those reports have been completed and that there's no areas of concern that would lead us to talk to the government about delaying their payment or changing their, their payment in any way. Thank you for that. I also had a question. In your opening statement, you talked about how some of the smaller organisations uh, in particular have strong link, like stronger links to the community and can have more of an impact in a way than some of the, some of the bigger, uh, bigger organisations. And it was just really to hear about uh, if you had any examples of some of those projects that, that have been funded through the, the smaller grants programme. I mean, we have a number of projects, and one of the ones that um, that I sent in as part of the evidence was the Love Plus project, and it's a really good example of um, an area that you wouldn't necessarily hear about much these days, so it's working with communities that are affected by leprosy. And this is an organisation which is really small in Scotland, and they've managed to make um, connections through... It was initially a church-based organisation, and often in developing countries, the, the churches have incredible reach into communities. And these are communities that are highly stigmatised. It's a disease that um, people, you know, people don't want anything to do with these people. They can become very isolated. And part of the impact that that project is having is working with these communities to support them economically. So in villages where there are a number of people affected by leprosy, um, they're developing work to allow them to generate their own income. And what's great when we read the reports from Love Plus is seeing how um, there's a number of different impacts that... that that project is seeing so um, not only are people able to start making their own income which is so important and um, they also find a place in that community so they have started for example selling crops at market a lot of them do chicken rearing so these are things that can actually benefit the wider community themselves and one of the great um, great things that we read in the most recent report was this, this sort of increased confidence of the community and people feeling part of something and belonging when a disease like leprosy can be so isolated so that's the reason why I included that because I thought it's a really sort of quite powerful example of how very not necessarily on a huge scale but on a smaller scale you can have a great impact for for different communities and there I mean Ian do you want to talk because you've about I was just want to add something on the reporting we do have the formal six month of the reporting but we do also encourage our um, projects to contact us so we'll have face-to-face -face meetings regularly with them um, and, and that way you build up a better rapport and um, you know then they're more willing to come when there's a problem early, and that's good. But we also um, try to actually visit some of the projects, so actually go out and see what the impact is, speak to the beneficiaries, because sometimes the beneficiaries have got a different view on the project from either the project manager in country or the project manager here. And so if we can sort of link those three up together, that gives us a, a rounder picture of the project. And when it comes to actually um, doing our assessments at the six monthly stages, um, it, we've got a better picture of what actually is happening on the ground. And in terms of the longer term sustainability then, would you say that it's been the case either in the vast majority or all of the, the uh, programmes that have been funded through the small grants that they've continued to have that, that longer term impact? 
I think a lot of the work that goes on through the small grants is about building capacity at community level and the other thing that the, the fund brings is actually building capacity of the delivery partners themselves. So there's a number of different ways to look at sustainability in that case. You know, if you're something like the Love Plus project, what you're doing is you're enabling people to generate income in a way that they possibly didn't have access to before. So for a few years you're putting in that, that energy and that support for them and they can then go on and grow businesses. So with the chicken rearing, for example, or any sort of animal agricultural project, often they can then sell animals to other to other people who can, you know, it's a way f to support them growing a business. And I think the um, the capacity building of the local partners is really important as well because this type of funding in its very nature institutional funding raises the standard of project delivery because there is more scrutiny um, than possibly other types of funders so projects are having to learn lessons about monitoring and evaluation and looking back and um, assessing the impact that they're having and a big part of that is learning lessons and then you adapt the way you work so apart um, for me anyway looking at the small grants the the way that those projects are starting to build sustainability is really supporting those smaller organizations in countries to, to raise up the work they're doing and, and look at more effective ways of, of working in development and often part of that is building the sustainability of the communities that they're working in. You can never guarantee what would happen in the future for every single project but I think going back to the importance of the assessment process and the application process requiring people to think about it and have a plan for it from the start and being able then through the reporting process and our ongoing contact to check whether those plans are in place gives you the best possible chance of doing that and I think that's what we're looking for our projects to achieve. Thank you. I just oh yeah no I'm that's sorry we're yeah. almost out of time. Stuart McMillan did you want to come in? Yes thank you. Yes thanks. Sure. Um, do, you, do you have a well, do you see a trend of organisations who are uh, applying uh, for, uh, with uh, different projects uh, round after round? To a certain extent I mean Ian you'd or John you would have the best view of whether there are people who were repeat funding yeah, I mean, I think um, overall you're looking at the the larger international NGOs with a base in Scotland, um, so Oxfam, Christian Aid, Tier Fund, um, those types of organisations will traditionally will apply. Um, but we've also seen, um, you know, a kind of increasing an increasing trend of um, universities applying as well, um, and. Uh, as I said, local authorities, health boards. So we do have a mix, but traditionally it will be the larger uh, international NGOs. I think with the benefits of the small grants program is that we've had um, a number of organisations sort of graduate from the small grants to applying for the main funding programmes. So for the Rwanda and, and Zambia funding round um, that ran this year, um, we've had um, two successful organisations, um, First Aid Africa, which I think have been spoken about already, and, and Gaia Education, who both um, uh, received a small grant and then graduated on and, and have been successful in receiving a, a larger grant as well. So um, I think that's been one of the real benefits of the Small Grants Programme, that we've um, seen an increase in these smaller um, NGOs um, actually uh, engaging with us and, and accessing these larger amounts of funding. Um, and so moving beyond, I suppose, the larger, um, uh, better known uh, international NGOs. I, I, think, sorry, I think for Malawi it's been a bit different. We've always had the, the big, the big um, um, six, so to speak, but actually because there's more um, civic links in Scotland, we've, we've had a, a full range of organisations applied to, to the Malawi rounds. But in terms of your process, you stated earlier on that you would check the financials uh, of the organisations, but if you are having well, larger NGOs and health boards, etc., applying, you wouldn't necessarily then go and check their financials every time they put in an application. Would you? Yeah. Same. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every new funding round, every application is treated the same. And I suppose where we've had, um, where we know that um, organisations have been funded before, we do look for evidence on how those projects have been managed because that's essential information to make sure that we're not going to be refunding an organisation that hasn't managed funds in the past. But every organisation would be taken through exactly the same process. So, I mean, organisations, no matter how, how big or small their um, sort of governance can change and their financial situation can change year on year. So it's really important that we do review that every time. So there's no hiding, I'm afraid, for anyone. Okay. Uh, and in terms of the, the applications uh, for each round, on average, uh, how many applications would come in as compared to what you actually successfully allocate money to? 
for um, so the, the, the last fund round, which was, was Zambia and Rwanda, um, we had approximately 40 applications. Um, uh, I can't remember the exact number. Kirsty might go to, to 49. 49. Yeah. Um, and we've taken through, um, as, as eventually 12 have been successful. Um, so 40, and we took um, a, probably about a sort of attrition rate of about 50% from concept note through to um, full application, maybe uh, fewer than that. Uh, and then, as I say, 12 uh, ultimately successful. From um, Malawi, the last funding round, we had 52 applications, um, 51 within criteria, and we funded in the end 20 projects. Okay. Uh, and in terms of the, the, the administration uh, aspect of this, uh, what, uh, do you have a particular percentage uh, target uh, that uh, you would look for in terms of that's the, 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 in terms of what money you allocate out? That's a percentage that would go towards administration, and that's a percentage that would go towards delivering the particular project. Yes. So if, if you mean the administration, the actual project by the, the successful organisation, mm -hmm. then um, yeah, so we have a, a 10% um, limit for Scottish-based administration costs. Um, so that's a maximum of 10%. Um, and those are for, for, for staff costs. Um, we don't fund overheads in Scotland, um, only running costs. Um, there isn't a, a similar limit for um, in-country administration costs, um, but um, you know, there are obvious benefits through um, creating employment in, in our um, partner countries as well. So we don't have limits, um, particularly um, if the administration costs in country were particularly high, then we would certainly question that and look for, for full justification as to why they were high. The, the other thing we would ask people not to, to just go for the 10%, we'd ask to, to actually look at their administrations. And to be honest, um, I, I find small organisations organizations are far better at that. You know, they're, they're, they're used to working on a, on a shoestring and they can they, they, um, manage, manage really well, is my experience. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, we're out of time now. Just, just before we, we finish up, I just wanted to go back to something that Ian Nicholl had said uh, and clarify me if I've picked you up wrong. Earlier on, you talked about, um, when you were talking about the RAG system, and you mentioned that in Malawi, you had quite a very few projects that, that got the green light and you had to go back to them. I was quite surprised at that, given the, the length of engagement that we have had with Malawi. I would have thought that there would have actually been more projects that that got a green light. It was just down to the the, the, the quality of the applications. I mean, they were all all assessed in the same manner, and it's just the um, you know seven, seven passed the, the benchmark, um, and then the the other forty five never. The, 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 the the quality was was um, 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 questionable in them. So we've done a little work on you know we, we'll. We, we fed that back in, and um, other organisations have been trying to do some work on applications. So we'll offer more support on the applications, but, but I'm afraid it was just a case of they never reached the benchmark. Is that because because our relationship with, with Malawi is is so well known that you're getting applications from less experienced applicants? Is that the reason for that? N no, no, no. Um, it was. I don't think it was. Um, it's a while since I've looked at them, but um, you know there was some surprising organisations in the in the in the amber, amber and red section. People you wouldn't expect, or people we wouldn't expect. It was just down to the standard of the applications. Right. Okay. Was that a, was that a, a fluke? Was it a one-off? Is that, a um, uh, that was that was the first time. I, that was my yeah. first round fund, funding round. So um, we're looking forward to see uh, you know if it was a fluke with the next the next funding round. Right. Okay. But it's different in Rwanda and Zambia. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, we we had. Um, yeah, we had we had a lot of good quality applications. Um, we did um, have some which which were a very small number, which were red, um, and a, a few amber. Uh, some of those which we went back to to see if we could, um, you know, help develop and um, help work with them and develop and, and push them into to green. Um, I think with um, Rwanda and Zambia, because we don't have um, the same depth of partnership and relationship as we do with Malawi, um, that you're possibly getting really just the larger organisations um, predominantly applying for that, who, who have more experience, have more resource to actually put towards um, uh, uh, actually putting together an application. So um, we kind of benefited from that in terms of getting probably overall more higher quality op applications. Just a final note on that. Actually, the size of the organisation, in my experience, um, bears very little resemblance to the quality of the application. We've got some fabulous applications from very small, you know, from individuals, actually. Yeah. 
I see. Well, thank you very much for that, and to all our witnesses uh, for coming to give evidence for us today. I'm now going to have a brief suspension so that we can change over our witnesses. Thanks again. Uh, we shall now continue with the committee's um, evidence in relation to the budget. Uh, and before, before we do, uh, I'd like to welcome a group of journalism students from Napier University uh, who are in the um, audience uh, today, um, the public gallery rather, today. Um, it's, uh, I was participating in a, an event um, in the Parliament uh, last week from the Political Studies Association about journalism, where we were, we were commenting that uh, not enough journalists paid attention to the work of the committees, so it's very good to see so many <laughs> students uh, uh, coming to hear about the work of our committee. Um, our, our evidence session uh, now is with Historic Environment Scotland, and I'd like to uh, welcome Alec Patterson, the Chief Executive, and Donella Steele, the Director of Finance with Historic Environment Scotland. Uh, Mr Patterson, would you like to make an opening statement. Well, thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you for the invitation to, um, to meet with the committee. Uh, my first time at this committee, and I think probably the first time that Historic Environment in Scotland, uh, in our new guise, has, uh, has been here as well, following the merger of Historic Scotland and RCAMS um, a couple of years ago. Um, I'll say just a few comments um, by way of introduction. Firstly, we are, um, as you'll know, the lead public body for Scotland's historic environment, and a lot of what we do 
is set within the context of the national strategy for the historic environment, our place uh, in time. We're a very diverse organisation. We look after 336 uh, properties in care of Scottish ministers across Scotland. So a major role we have is conserving them and making sure that they're enjoyed not just by us, but by generations to come. 77 of those sites are staffed, including um, some of Scotland's leading visitor attractions. Um, and as you'll know yourself, um, visitor numbers are increasing. We're a, a regulator, we're part of the planning system in that we look after listings and designations, and we um, look after a lot of Scotland's uh, national historic record through our archives and our uh, collections. We're investing a lot in traditional skills, and we're doing some very interesting work, which many people perhaps don't appreciate in, in areas such as climate change and uh, digital documentation and visualization and increasingly augmented uh, reality. Our organization, the new merged organization, has a single operating plan. We have five themes which the whole organization is aligned behind. And in the year 1617, we had a very successful first year as a new organization, delivering 96% uh, of our KPIs. And uh, I'm pleased to say we're making good progress uh, in delivering our current year's um, uh, performance uh, uh, indicators as well. Um, our budget is a combination of grant and aid and commercial income raised through a, a range of um, uh, vehicles such as admissions prices at our sites and membership and other commercial operations as well. And this year, the year we're in, we've had a, an increase to our budget, a capital increase to help us um, take on some projects as well as benefiting from an increase in commercial income through increased visitor numbers. Final thing I just want to say is that while the word historic is in our name, uh, we don't just deal in the past and the historic environment and this organisation is very relevant to the world of today and I would argue that the past will help shape Scotland's future. We're a significant contributor to most of the national performance indicators that the Scottish Government has. Um, the 4.3 million visitors that came to visit our sites, paying visitors last year, contributed to over £400 million to the tourism economy. We spent £32 million in local contractors and suppliers, which in turn supports uh, local economic growth and local jobs. Um, through our work, we support over 15,000 FTEs uh, across Scotland and over 100,000 learning opportunities were provided to youngsters in schools and colleges across Scotland last year. And through our grants programme, then the reach of our funding extends into many local projects across Scotland. So we're a young organisation, we're an ambitious organisation, um, there is lots that we yet want to do, but I think we've made good progress since the formation of the organisation um, in 2015. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Patterson. As you say, you are a young organisation born out of the merger of two organisations. Uh, have, has, the, has the merger saved money or are you still carrying over costs of the merger? So if you look at the objectives of the merger, there were seven objectives set out um, in the, uh, at, at the time the merger was um, agreed. Um, we, uh, and we believe that all seven of those objectives have been delivered. There was an independent gateway review undertaken that confirmed that the transformation, uh, or the, sort of the transition to the new organisation had been successfully uh, delivered. Um, I, our focus is really about making sure as one organisation we're delivering to a consistent uh, agenda, which is why uh, you won't find any reference to merger in the organisation anymore. It is one organisation with one corporate plan with five themes that the whole organisation gets behind. In terms of the budgets, um, we've benefited, I think, in the last couple of years from increased budget, um, partly to address some of the long-standing financial challenges that the historic environment has, but also to invest in new um, experiences at many of our sites. So our budget has increased um, staff um, security of employment, which is one of the objectives of the merger, has been maintained. So um, I think the benefits of the merger are starting to emerge and the objectives set out at the outset have been, have been realised. That's great. I'm sure you're delighted your budget's increased, but were there costs associated with the merger that you're still carrying or are you already making savings because of uh, back office staff and that kind of thing? That's what I asked. Yeah, sorry. So uh, the merger itself had a budget attached to it, and that was delivered within the budget that was, that was, that was allocated to it. Um, there's no doubt that in terms of moving forward, um, there will be savings because we don't have to replicate activities that were 
replicated within the two organisations. We are moving into things like you know, shared IT services, you know, shared um, uh, HR functions. So clearly there will be efficiencies where these things aren't duplicated and we can provide that services or those services consistently across the organisation. Now you mentioned uh, the increase in your visitor numbers, which is very Im impressive, and obviously that generates an income uh, for you. Uh, do you expect a similar footfall in 2018, and how do you plan to optimise that and use it in the best interests of the organisation? So, um, visitor numbers uh, last year were 4.3 million. That was a record, um, which we thought might be a challenge to, to match. Um, this year, year to date, visitor numbers are 19% up across the whole of the estate. It varies from site to site, but if you aggregate it across our estate, then visitor numbers are up uh, again. Um, so that does provide additional income. And uh, one of the things we did at the start of this year was to develop um, a prioritization as to how we might use income um, most effectively. So we're doing a number of things with it. Um, one is um, historic sites don't stand still, they deteriorate just by standing there with climate change and other issues, they, they deteriorate. So we've been able to allocate additional funds to um, progress the conservation work that we've been um, uh, charged with delivering. Um, the second thing we've done is been able to um, bring forward a number of improved visitor experiences at many of our sites. It's part of what we do year in, year out, but we've, we're looking at a number of areas where a number of sites where we want to you know, do something quite significant in improving the visitor experience. So the benefit of additional visitors is having a direct impact on our core business, which is looking after these historic sites, improving the visitor experience, and also enabling us to put some money, which we haven't been able to do for many years, into other areas such as digitising our archives so that they are more and more available to anybody through, you know, through, uh, through online, uh, online access. So a range of uh, ways in which we've been, we've been deploying uh, the resources, but driven by four cr real criteria. One is about conservation of the sites we have. The second is about improving the visitor experience. The third is around um, preserving the, the cultural significance of our sites and our collections. And the fourth criteria we look at is um, how does our investment leverage um, wider benefits, whether it's economic, social, community uh, benefits. So those are the four lenses through which we look at our, our investment priorities. But as I say, it's been uh, manifest in funds into, um, the, in, into our core business. Are you able to say which particular sites have benefited from the extra money? Where have you, where have you put the money? Oh, um, uh, many sites across Scotland. I, mean, we, I think it's probably 60 or 70 different sites are benefiting in, in different ways. Um, in some, it is conservation work that, for budget restrictions, we haven't been able to do in the past, so we've been able to do that type of work. In others, it has been improving the visitor experience. So let, me, let me take just a couple. Um, you know, Dune might be a good example, where visitor numbers have increased quite considerably. Um, and at that site, in particular, we've done a number of things. Um, one is there was mason repairs that has to be done, so we've managed to do that. Um, secondly, we've um, uh, improved the toilets. Uh, and I'll come back to car parks and toilets is one of the biggest challenges we have. So we've improved the toilets, we've improved the shop and the visitor experience there, and we're having a look at the car parking around that type of, that type of site. It's a good example of looking at a site in the round and saying what more can we do, what more need we do. Calaverock is one we're having a look at just now. Fantastic um, site. We think it has more potential, so we're doing work around the paths at the moment. We're improving the, the um, visitor experience. We're looking at augmented reality. We're having a look at car park options there. And of course, during the summer, we brought jousting back to Calaverick as well. So there are um, literally dozens of small projects across Scotland where we're addressing either visitor issues or um, conservation challenges. But there's a number of projects, Dune being one, Edinburgh being one, Calaverick being another, Orkney being another, where we're looking at the sites in the round and saying, what can we collectively do to improve the offer? The South of Scotland MSP, I'm delighted to hear about your plans for Calaverick. Uh, Richard Lockhead. Thank you and good morning. <clears throat> there must be a figure somewhere that uh, you have about the backlog in terms of all the properties you have to repair or upgrade or protect. 
and I just wondered what that figure would be. So back in um, January of this year, we published a report, which was um, a report on the conditions on the properties in care. And it outlines um, the, the different factors that impact on them and, and, and so on and how we measure it. But it concluded that um, there probably was a backlog of, in the order of 65 million, um, accumulated over a number of years. Um, a sum which would be required over a period of time, and we're talking over 10 years or so, to take the physical conditions of the sites from where they are today to a condition that we'd like to have them in. So that was the backlog figure which um, we published back in, um, back in January. And what we've been doing um, over the course of this year is say, well, let's, let's take some strides towards addressing some of that backlog. So some of the additional capital income or capital funding that came from the Scottish Government allied to some additional investment that we've been able to put in through the visitor numbers has allowed us to make progress towards both addressing some of the backlog but also you know, taking forward sort of new developmental work. But that, that was the figure which we published in January. Okay. Clearly quite a significant figure. So in terms of the increased number of visitors, which is great news, what does that generated in extra income give us a, an indication of what that means? So um, our, our figures, our estimated income uh, when we, for last year was that we would have a, a commercial income of around about, what was it now, 40, 49 million. Uh, I think the year before, we estimated it would be was it 40, 42. Anyway, the, the outcome last year was our commercial income was, was, was um, 49 million gross. There's a, there's a cost of sales that comes off that, which uh, is cost incurred in delivering that. Um, this year, we expect our commercial income to be probably sort of mid-high 50s. Yeah, we're only part way through the year, but th that's the sort of the order of magnitude uh, which the um, which the visitor number increase has has um, has delivered. Now, that's not all within our gift to use. There's a discussion clearly we have with Scottish government about how income in excess of what we predict is is used. But 49 gross last year, um, high mid high 50s is our expectation for the current financial year. Um, and as I say, we've been able to you know, deploy a lot of that into core deficit, but also development opportunities, which um, I guess for many years we haven't been able to do. Well, that sounds very encouraging. That's a significant increase, thanks to the number of people visiting Scotland, as well as local people. In terms of commercial income and working with the private sector, I clearly have been working with you over Dallas too in my constituency, and there's some exciting, prestigious companies wanting to get involved with that. And it's slightly frustrating, it's taken several years of, you know, raising this time and time again to get anywhere, but uh, we can perhaps put that to one side. But is there any obstacles that you feel the government could help to knock down that prevents you having better relationships with the private sector or getting commercial income? Um, if I was being honest, no. No. Um, I mean, we, we, we operate within a, a governance framework with framework agreements and other sort of things with government. Um, but, by and large, the f I couldn't identify any major obstacles. Um, we have a trading company through which we can bring in um, uh, non-core activity. We've got a good settlement through grant and aid. We've got an arrangement, which I guess is always negotiable, around um, how we can use additional income we, we bring in, because we realise that we're in a very sort of fortuitous position of having the commercial income option. Um, so no, I think we've got a very good working relationship with government, and um, you know the dialogue is open, and um, you know opportunities to develop commercial income is just one of the one of the angles we'll we'll be looking at going forward. But I wouldn't identify any major issues. Final question is in terms of. Uh, your organisation's wider role in supporting the Scottish economy and particularly the likes of our town high streets and, and city high streets. Uh, there was a case in, in Murray and in Elgin just recently where your organisation knocked back a development proposal for some empty derelict buildings on the high street in Elgin, which is clearly a bit of a blight. Uh, I'm trying to get my head around how you see your role uh, I understand clearly you have to look out for the, the conservation criteria, but 
The result is, in that case, without being too parochial, but I'm sure it's replicated elsewhere, we're left with a blight on the high street, which is very unfortunate from the local economy's point of view. Is your attitude to just look at the application and just knock it back, or is your, is your attitude, we're going to get stuck into this and find a way through this so we can improve the high street in Elgin or any other towns or cities in Scotland and, and maybe offer some financial support and be proactive about it? So a number of points in there. I, mean, I think in terms of support for high streets generally, we have a grant scheme, and that's what it does. It provides support for um, you know, re refurbishment of properties and, and so on in, 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 um, in many towns across Scotland. Um, and we've just um, uh, announced a new round of that CARS, it's called, of, of CARS funding. Um, so we do support um, town centre regeneration and, and, and so on. Uh, I think in terms of... the I think the, the, the approach, and um, I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, but it's in the 90s percent of cases that we are asked to look at that we approve, whether it's for listings or designations and so on. So the number that we actually um, push back on are actually very small. On, on, without going into specific of Elgin, our, our approach would normally be to engage with a developer, whoever they were, at an early stage and provide input and advice at that early stage. Um, and if we take a view to um, object to a, a development, then there's a very clear and transparent process and rationale for why we've done it. There is always an opportunity to engage with a developer after a decision to say, well, how best can we take something forward? And there are other cases around Scotland where it's not been a case of no for no sake. There's been a good reason why we've said no, bearing in mind we say no very, very rarely. But we definitely want to engage with projects to see how can we make something happen, either at an earlier stage where understanding the issues is important, or in a case like that where a decision has been made to object, how can we work with the developer to see if there's a more acceptable project that can come forward? Okay, well, I'll leave that with you. I mean, maybe there's a way in which you can find a more proactive role to go out and find those blights where perhaps developers are not attracted to developing them because they feel that because it's listed, it's going to be either very expensive or there's going to be too many obstacles to overcome. And what I'm interested in is just the outcome, the fact that we're left with a blight in the high street in one of our major communities in Scotland. And I just wonder whether, because they're listed, these buildings, there's a way in which your organisation can proactively intervene. So I'll leave that with you maybe to think about. Well, and my only final comment on that is, you know, um, it shouldn't be the case that because something is listed, it means nothing can happen. And I think, you know, our encouragement to any developer of a project is to come and speak to our team quickly and early to understand what the art of the possible is round about it. But we can pick up separately on the on the specific. Thanks. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, um, good morning. Um, certainly, the, the committee understands that uh, the historic environment of Scotland helps to develop skills and uh, building capacity in the sector by working in partnership uh, with the construction, repairs and maintenance sectors to deliver the traditional skills strategy. And certainly kind of one aspect of that would be in terms of stained glass. Uh, now, I'm, I'm certainly you mentioned quite a number of, uh, quite a number of properties that, uh, that you look after. Um, is that certainly a feature that, uh, that yourselves really have to consider in terms, of, um, in terms of the issue of stained glass and any particular training uh, that would be required for that going forward? Um, yeah, I was at Glasgow Cathedral a couple of weeks ago and stained glass is... Is, is, a, is an issue with the conservation of, of the cathedral. So where, where stained glass is part of the, the fabric and the, the, the conservation of, of one of the properties, then yes, we, we would have to um, you know, be able to address that challenge as well. I, I might come back to you on the specific of stained glass, but the general point about traditional skills is really important. Um, we've just opened something called the engine shed up in Stirling, um, which has as its focus traditional skills, materials, knowledge, and, and so on, from, you know, for, uh, blacksmithing right through to ev everything there. So whether stained glass is an integral part of it, I need to come back and check with you. But traditional skills, um, the development of them, the encouragement of them, the promotion of modern apprenticeships, we've been discussing the Skills Development Scotland, how we develop a, a broader framework around traditional skills. So it's hugely important for us and for the sector going forward that we that we invest and look at opportunities to develop in the engine shed as a bit of a manifestation of our commitment to that type of thing. I certainly mean, the convener and I, we've had this discussion a couple of times regarding the issue of uh, stained glass, and uh, certainly uh, uh, there aren't too many people around at the moment 
who can deliver that, that particular service, and certainly going forward, um, then there will be less people. So it, it may well be an opportunity uh, for yourself to consider. I'm happy to take that on, and you know, the point you make is, is a very valid one, that in some of the skills, the, 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 the number of people out there able to deliver them is actually very small and sometimes diminishing. Um, and so, you know, part of the work with SDS is refreshing the traditional skills strategy, but also ourselves looking at how we can support some of these um, skills that are maybe small in number, but actually very specialist and important. Uh, and so in terms of the organisation, how much time um, does the organisation spend in terms of uh, planning and uh, planning applications? Oh, in terms of time, I couldn't give you a quantification of that. All, all I would say is that I think it's on a, it's on a monthly basis. We are dealing with over between two and three hundred cases that come through. So it's part of your yeah. So our, our heritage directorate, um, where our um, listings, designations, planning function sits, um, deals with all of that. But it's it's off the top of my head, it's over three thousand a year we're dealing with. Okay. No, certainly, it's, uh, I know I've raised, uh, through correspondence, I've raised an issue with you uh, regarding kind of wider planning. Uh, and uh, certainly, it's no, certainly not for today, but I'm keen to sit down and actually have a discussion with you about that yep. uh, after here. If that's okay. Fine. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, convener. Thank you. I'll just follow up on that. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I'm interested in this as well. As the convener of the Cross Party Group on Culture, the area of stained glass, where we once were world leaders in stained glass in the Victorian period, uh, we now have uh, no uh, nowhere where it's actually been taught at that really mm -hmm. advanced level since Edinburgh University um, shut down the glass department that um, teaches stained glass. So perhaps both Mr McMillan and I could follow up on that, because it obviously has a big impact on your buildings, because we'll have to import uh, stained glass artists and concept conservatives in the future if we don't train them. Uh, Mary Gujan, I think you had a specific uh, supplementary yeah, on the skills. The traditional skills element as well, because uh, I represent Angus and Northern Mairns and uh, Brechin, the city where I come from, uh, had Townscape Heritage inif Initiative funding to be able to do a lot of work uh, that people wouldn't have been able to do otherwise without that funding, because obviously trying to look after and conserve what are uh, a lot of Brechin High Street was like category A listed buildings, which people just did not have the money to be able to, to upkeep their properties before. And it really just was going back to the likes of traditional stonemasons uh, and other uh, industries like that. I mean, how big an issue is the shortage or is the skills shortage at the moment? Uh, and just wondering what are the other, uh, you talk about skills development Scotland, uh, so what is actively being done and are you, as a result of the work that they are doing, are you starting to see more people coming forward into the more uh, traditional skills? Um, so, so we've actually just agreed with Skills Development Scotland to do something which I think is maybe the first, which is a sector skills, a sector, a skills investment plan for the heritage sector. As I think, um, yeah, if you if you go if you went to the sort of the the OPIT um, strategic historic environment forum that the cabinet secretary chairs, then skills is probably one of the biggest issues that comes out from that. So we've we've we've, we've embarked on that project, and we hope to have something coming out of it by the spring of next year. That will quantify both the current and the future requirements, but anecdotally we know um, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a skills gap. Um, I think there's a number of ways of addressing it. One is, and we're working with CITB in this, is how does heritage skills become more of an integral part into mainstream construction training? That would be, that would be useful. Um, Secondly, you know, we've expanded our apprenticeship programme, so can we bring more youngsters in through apprenticeship routes, and we're looking at foundation apprenticeships as well, um, to address some of the gaps we have. Um, we had, I think, uh, was it around about 10 apprentices finished their training last year, and we took them all on, um, because we know how important they are to us. But even if we don't, then they find their way into the, into the sector, into the contractors, but there's, there's a shortage. We, actually, we also have an intern programme, where we place interns with small businesses. So I was looking at a video last night, for example, of um, one of our interns who's a blacksmith um, who's been placed with a company. Um, and that's about not trying to you know, train 100 blacksmiths, but it's small numbers developing these specialist skills. So um, we're trying to address it um, through um, a skill strategy. We're trying to address it through apprenticeship programmes. 
Um, we are addressing it also through the engine shed where it is a facility for the sector and beyond, and a lot of international interest in this as well, to come and get high quality training in these traditional skills. So huge issue uh, going forward. And it's also important, I think, this is what we try and do through our grant schemes, is that when um, some of these works are being specified, then the, the need for the traditional skills is built in by architects and others who are influencing uh, the design of some of these projects. So we'll have a quantification on it going forward. Uh, and, um, intuitively, we all know that traditional skills is a challenge, but there's a number of steps already we're taking um, to try and increase the supply. Just another quick question on the back of that. I mean, you talk about apprenticeships and internships and things, and for new people coming in, uh, into the various uh, sectors and industries, but are there opportunities there for people who to perhaps reskill so they could already be involved in a trade, but to actually pick up some of those more traditional methods? Yeah, I, I, well, absolutely. And, uh, Yes, and, and, and well, probably yes. Where there are apprenticeship frameworks, yes. One of the conversations we've been having with, with Skills Development Scotland is some of the skills within the sector are quite specific, small numbers, and therefore you need some tailored awards and tailored qualifications for them. So that's what we're, we're trying to do. We've also formed a partnership with Forth Valley College and the University of Stirling just to try and make sure we've got a joined upness on skills, because at one level you need it for traditional skills, at another level you need it for leading edge digital augmented reality and climate change science and research. So through that partnership, we either can or will very soon be able to offer a full qualifications provision for right through the entire SCQF framework. So at, at all ends of the, of the skills framework, if you like, but with a particular focus right now on the traditional skills um, craft side. Okay, thank you. I, sorry. I'm not finished. So I take it, given that this is budget scrutiny, that you are putting more of your budget and planning to put more of your budget into this area in the coming years. Is that right? Uh, we are. I mean, the, the, the engine shed itself was a major uh, multi-million pound project, as, as, um, as, as evidence of it. We've increased our own apprenticeship programme. Um, as an organisation, leaving aside moving beyond just traditional skills, we've got a new people strategy, so we're putting more money into developing our own people. So, absolutely. Okay, excellent. Rachel Hamilton. engagement for young people and ahead of the uh, year of young people I wondered how um, Historic Environment Scotland were going to use their budget to encourage young people to to go to your um, sites and to visit and I know you obviously have an educational visit program but but what plans do you have ahead of the year of young people um, pl plans that hopefully we'll be able to announce quite soon um, we did a lot for this year, History, Heritage and Archaeology. That was, to some extent, an easy year. It's a year that had our name on it. Yet next year is, a, is an opportunity. So we actually do a huge amount of work with young people already. The, the, the opportunity from a themed year is to do something a bit above and beyond that. So we have a number of, um, a number of initiatives uh, planned for, for next year. We're also working with Young Scott. Um, to help shape up some of these initiatives because you know, part of the requirement for the Year of Young People is the co-design of initiatives with, um, with young people. Um, so um, do I have a list of them off the top of my head? M maybe not, but we have a fairly extensive programme for next year. One of the things we also want to do is create a youth forum so that a legacy extends beyond just 2018. And so through that, we want to make sure that the voice of young people is heard feeding into what we as an organisation do on an ongoing basis thereafter. But I'm looking at Daniela whether she's got more detail in the year of young people or not, but we have a fairly extensive programme almost ready to go. No, no, no further detail here with us today, but we can make it available yeah. to the committee afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's not long. It's only, you know, yep. in about six weeks' time or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, be great. Could you to the committee and, and tell us sure. the, the detail of that? Thanks. Could I also ask a, diff a different uh, subject question? Um, I just wondered if you believe that there are um, any continuing issues in the integration of um, your predecessor bodies? Um, continuing issues. I think I'll go back to my opening comment which says the merger has been effected and the objectives that were set at the start have been successfully delivered. Um, but that is a start. And the, the, the opportunity that the merger brought is to um, realise the benefits 
and that's really you know, where we're at now. So in terms of outstanding issues, we're making very good progress. We'll probably come to the end of projects related to IT, where everyone now is on one IT system. We've integrated HR, so there is one, I, one HR function. Um, and I think, you know, it is now about focusing on what are the opportunities that the merger brings. And there are some already there. Um, and just moving the organisation forward, a major part of it was just having one clear operating plan for the organisation. So we're all aligned behind the same five priorities, irrespective of where we are or where we came from. Um, so transition to the new organisation complete, the benefits being realised, but further to go. And has the Scottish Government been supportive of, of the, the merger of the bodies and, and have they given you support during that process? Um, it's a difficult question for me to answer, probably an even more difficult one for Danella to answer. Danella joined us in the summer and I've only been here for just over a year. So I guess we came in at the end of the process. Um, all, all I would say is, I mean, I, 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 the sense I get was the merger was not an easy couple of years for staff and good to be through it. And there was a bit of a revolving door in my seat for a bit of time as well, which probably didn't help. So just a bit of stability has been helpful, I think, over over this year. I can only speak from the experience of the last year, which is that um, I've had nothing but support from the Scottish Government in terms of um, my thoughts in taking the organisation forward, um, the provision of additional capital funding to enable us to address some of the challenges that we alluded to earlier. So, um, uh, and I compare it with experiences elsewhere that I had before I came here. So um, we're, I'm very comfortable with the support we've, we have from the Scottish Government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you. Apologies for being late. I was uh, another committee dealing with ferries. Relevant. So well, well, um, I actually wanted to ask you about development management as well, uh, along the lines of Richard Lockhead, um, because it's not just your budget gets affected, it's, the, it's the, another organisation's budget, and ultimately in the case I'm going to uh, give to you, it's, it's another government department's budget. So uh, you're familiar with Scalloway, you're familiar with the schedule and monument that is Scalloway Castle, with your previous mm -hmm. jobs high, you, you know there's a two-storey fish market there, there's Scottish sea farms there, there's two ice plants there, there's a heap of business all around that scheduled mm -hmm. monument. There's now a business who want to develop um, a new, uh, they want to develop their own business, uh, which has been given a grant by the Scottish Government, Mr Ewing's department, a very, uh, in my view, rightly supported them in that way. And the paperwork I've seen last night is that Historic Scotland are blocking this development, uh, despite, uh, with their argument being the visual impact on a, on a scheduled monument, um, when the neighbouring buildings are all higher than the proposed <laughs> development. And that's mm -hmm. a bit I don't understand. I just don't understand. So, in a, you know, you, your organisation could cost this business a huge amount of money to go through appeals process and all the rest of it. What I don't understand is why, uh, from first principles, your development team didn't go up and have a look and say, wait a minute, this development is actually smaller than mm -hmm. the neighbouring uh, neighboring buildings, and therefore, while we may not like it, it's actually very difficult to argue on visual impact grounds that, that this proposed development, particularly it's being granted by the government, mm -hmm. it's being supported by local planning authorities, being supported by Shetland Arts Council. Um, everyone else has been through this and says it's okay. And I wonder if you could go away and look at that and come back to me and, and find a better way to allow this business to get on with what they're trying to do, which is to create jobs in a rural part, of, an island part yep. of Scotland. They export all over the world. Mm -hmm. This is a good business and I want it to succeed. Well, I, I know, I know Scalloway well, so uh, I, I'm glad you're not asking me to respond to it just now, but yeah, let me look at that for you. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm following your, I'm, I'm following your principal convener of, of constituency issues. Um, there are there's some other areas that I, that I would like to cover, um, and particularly you were recently accredited as a living wage employer. Um, I wonder if you could um, explain whether that, why that's important to your organisation, and whether there are any impacts on your budget. Well. It, we just have to be, is, is, is the bottom line. Um, and it's just taken us a wee while to, to get to the point. But yes, a few weeks ago, um, we were uh, awarded the Scottish Living Wage Employer Accreditation. Um, and that living wage extends to all our apprentices as well. So everyone in the organisation is now covered uh, with that. Will it affect our budget? Yeah, marginally. But you know, we build that in as we do with the, sort of the, the, the pay um, the pay remit every year, so it's just part of our ongoing budgeting. But it's, I think the most significant thing is for us to be able to say 
And we're also a healthy working lives accredited employer. We've now got Scottish living wage accreditation. That's just what an organisation like us has to be. Uh, also, your corporate plan in 2016, uh, key element of your, your, your mission uh, is that Scotland's historic environment is cherished and understood and shared uh, with pride by everyone. Now, we've talked about uh, what you're doing in terms of young people in education, but obviously in terms of reaching out to hard-to-reach groups, um, not necessarily just young people, but that's a very important um, aspect of of that mission as well uh, and obviously in terms of the Scottish Government's priorities in terms of fairness and inequality and inclusivity what are you doing to reach out to those harder to reach groups? Quite a lot so on equality specifically we've got a new qualities um, report and four equalities outcomes which we're working towards which is which is one element of it um, we have an access policy and contained within the access policy is a lot of the work we're doing to try and reach out to a number of a number of different groups. We're working with Ewan's Guide for, um, for, for that group. We're working with the um, sign language, probably haven't got the name right, um, a group to help us on their interpretation for other, other, um, other areas. So the whole issue about broadening the appeal of Scotland's historic environment, enabling access to our sites, whether physically or digitally. One of the things we're developing a number of sites is sort of virtual reality, where either access is not easy um, or where you know, um, individuals can't, can't, uh, can't have the physical experience, developing other ways in which the historic environment can be enjoyed. So in a whole number of areas, both through our own equalities of, um, uh, agenda and strategy, but also in terms of our outreach to visitors and making the historic environment accessible, a whole raft of things we're doing um, to try and make sure that we're um, uh, appealing to all. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and finally, you talked there and earlier about putting some of the additional uh, revenue into digitisation. Can you give us a little bit more detail about the kind of material uh, that you're spending money digitising and when that will be available uh, for the public to look at? So one of the things we're developing just now is a, a digital strategy for the organisation. Um, we just, again, it's one of these things that the living wage, you know, the world is going digital, so we need to go there as well. Um, it doesn't mean we're not, because in some of the stuff we do, particularly around our digital uh, documentation and visualisation, um, particularly in terms of how we look at, um, at monuments and their condition, we are probably you know, world leading in terms of that aspect of digitisation. We're starting to use... Um, augmented reality and apps to demonstrate and provide access to some of our sites. The, the digitization I, I referred to earlier was, I think, specifically around the archive. So we have a huge archive. There's 1.2 million items currently available um, through um, Canmore and, and Scran, the two, the two websites. And what we've done this year is allocate a bit of additional funds to try and accelerate the process or the speed uh, at which the archives are digitised. So we, we sh we're aiming to put another at least 50,000 items in th from the archive into digital format this current financial year. And that's the direction of travel that we want to, we want to um, uh, progress over coming years. And that will be free to access, will it? Yes, that's that. so you can go on to Canmore and these places just now and you can access a lot of that free. There's a slight charge if you want to download very high res images, but the vast majority of that is accessible free. Okay. Uh, does that include things like your aerial photography collection? Um, that's, no, that's more of a commercial thing. That's a commercial yeah. thing? Yeah. So and how, how does that work then? Um, there is, there is the different types of aerial photography. There's, something, there's an NCAP, which is a national collection of aerial photography, which is um, part of our commercial um, activities. So that is made available um, on a commercial basis. But if there are other aerial photographs within Canmore, then the, the free access would apply to them just as it would apply to other items within that database. Okay. But it is something that you're planning to spend money on over the next few years. And so when you next come before the committee, I think this is your first visit, it would be your last, so we're looking forward to hearing from you again. So you'll be able to give us more details on your digital strategy the next time you appear before Correct. the committee. Correct. And part okay. of it will be archives, and part of it will be the experience you get when you go to our sites, and part of it will be Calavrock, where we're looking at what's the opportunity around augmented reality to enhance the visitor experience, and part of it will be around how we take forward the use of digital expertise to um, understand and 
help us manage the conservation of our, of our site. So a broad ranging um, approach to digital. Thank you very much. Um, if members don't have any other questions, uh, I shall draw this session to a close and I'd like to thank our witnesses for coming to give evidence for us today. Thank you. Uh, we now move into private session.